Good morning. This is Josh Bennett. It's a Saturday morning wake up. We uh, got a few guys missing. Steve Floyd's out catching monstrous fish, hopefully, supposedly. And uh, Aaron's on his way in here. A um, little bit backwards. I had some stuff come up this morning, so I'm trying to regain consciousness here. <laughs> We got Smitty running the board for us today. Appreciate you coming in. No problem. Good deal. Um, basically, the phone lines are open. Uh, we'll take some calls and do whatever. Like I said, my mind's off in other spacious places right now. Um, shoot. I had a bunch of stuff I want to talk about, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got somebody on the phones already, if you... Really? Why don't just go straight there? Let's try it. All right. Hi, Hello. you're on the air. Hi. Um, you've been talking about different books at different times, and you were mentioning one that discussed merit. In other words, this would be the moral high ground for conservatives. Can you think of a name or the author of that book? Moral high grounds. <laughs> yeah. In other words, <clears throat> don't don't just argue that this is the economical thing to do point out that if people are rewarded for merit rather than, uh, uh, what should I say, entitlements, mm-hmm. that they are, uh, they, you know, it improves the whole community because people are rewarded for actually doing something and doing the right thing, not just filling out the forms. Right. I'm trying to think because we've got so many different books that we talk about. It was fairly, fairly modern. It was something that had been put out in the last year or so about it might have been whatever happened to justice okay by um richard mayberry who's actually going to be a guest on the program on the 7th of july that one talks mostly about um the difference between political law which we talk a lot about the difference between political law and uh, positive law and common law or natural law Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. The, the other outfit that that uh, talks about merit quite a bit is is the military. They claim you don't get promoted unless you show a certain amount of merit by getting a certain amount of stuff done. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> whatever happened to justice is your best guess at this moment. Yeah, right. This shoot. I'm trying to think because, like I said, we suggest numerous books. Yeah. Um, from the Mises Institute, a lot of them you can get online um, for free, downloads, PDFs. Whatever happened to Justice, I don't think we have any copies at Aaron's store at Far North Tactical, but we give them away there normally. I'll try to get some down there this week or okay. today or tomorrow or something. We're guy, we just give them away because it's worth having. Um, I'll be listening to you as carefully as I can for the next two hours, so if somebody thinks of something, don't hesitate to mention it. <laughs> yeah, if someone wants to... Call in or text me. They can think of something a little closer. I think merits. That is a pretty interesting thing, though. Uh, the difference between the just getting something for nothing. It's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Being on that well, versus pe- people uh, should be re- rewarded for doing the right thing, not just for you know taking up space. Right. And, and, yeah, there's a place for, for mercy and, uh, uh, what should I say, welfare, all of these kind of things. There's a place for that. But that's not the overall scheme of what we should be promoting. Right, you know, and so definitely the system that we have promotes it because, well... Helplessness and dependency. And look at politicians. Who gets elected? The ones that promise the most goodies on the other yeah. side. Yeah. Give me elected, which is really what... Our main focus, well, not main, one of our focuses we talk about is the fact that you get basically scumbags run for office. The people, <laughs> no, they're, think about it. In regular life, you and I, if you want something from your neighbor, can you just go over and steal it? No. No, all of society looks at that and says that's wrong. But a politician, on the other hand, can promise to do the exact same thing to constituents. He can say, I will steal from your neighbor and give it to you, and people will vote him in for it. Yeah. And society, because all of us think that we can get some of that benefit from that stealing, or we're okay from it. Now, if neighbor George comes over and steals from you, you're going to get your shotgun out and let him have it or whatever. But as long as it's 
political, but it's the exact same thing. It's still stealing, but political Joe, or let's just say, I don't want to call him Joe Miller. Okay. Let's just say whatever politician yeah. comes in, he can steal from you. Yeah, and, and give it no... to the same person, and there's nothing wrong with it. In yeah, fact, and, it's encouraged. And... In fact, all of society says, "What a great thing!" And the guy that and the guy that says he'll steal the most is the guy that gets elected. Yeah. So it's totally backwards. To where theft we say is wrong, but if it's the government stealing, then all of society says, "Ah, there's nothing wrong with that." I think there is. The, well, the, stealing, side, stealing, the but... side of it you haven't mentioned yet is consent. Right. No, that's a really good point, which uh, we talk about a lot, too, is withdrawing consent. But you don't have any choice if they're going to come and steal from you, do you? That's, that's very true. Right. No matter what you think about it, you don't have a choice. You can't You can't decide that you're going to withdraw your consent to the point that you're just not going to let them steal because they'll come and kill you, basically. It's all by the end of the, of a, the point of a gun is... I am going to steal from you. And normally when you can, in the real world, if your neighbor steals from you, you can defend your property. When the government steals from you, they can kill you for not letting them. So it's all kind of backwards. Yeah, yeah. But definitely. we let it happen. Society goes. I mean, that's uh, the uh, impossibility. Hans Hermann Hoppe has a thing called, uh, a lecture called The Impossibility of Unli- of Limited Government. Oh, it, and uh, you can get that on the Mises Institute. It's a free download, or uh, it's on our website. And it's exactly what he talks about. It's impossible to have limited government because what is what is government's duty? What why do we have government? What did the founding fathers said, or uh, John Locke? They said that the the purpose of government was to protect private property. Well, right off the bat, what does government have to do to protect that property? Take it from. They have to take it from you. Well, they have to extort it at the very least. Yeah. So they have to steal your property to supposedly take care of, protect your property. And since they have the monopoly on protecting your property, well, automatically, anybody that has a monopoly is going to give less service and charge more. And we've seen that in the last 200 and some odd years with the government. Since they have a monopoly on protecting your property, and yet they have to steal your property to be able to, quote unquote, afford to protect your property... The 40% of your uh, paycheck is taken from you. Right. So your the uh, service goes down, obviously. It has. We have more crime now than ever. So the service goes down and the charge goes up because they can decide what, they will, what service they're going to give you, and they can also decide how much to charge you for it. May I address another side of what you're talking about? Go for it. You, the government has a monopoly, but here in Alaska... The government sells monopolies. Oh yeah, good old fascism working. Yeah, and they, you know, they've seen to it that there's three companies that own own the pipeline. So the, then they have the monopoly to, pr- to decide who can produce and who can uh, uh, not just produce. What do you say? You can explore and and uh, you know produce oil. And uh, they got all these boards and commissions that have a limited entry kind of a thing. You can only have so many architects, so many dentists, so many veterinarians, so that they can keep the the supply low and the price high. Yeah, it's and, uh, it's just a totally it's another yeah. form of monopoly, and it's all from government. I know yeah, they, you hear on the they, radio they all the time it. people gripe about all oh, the stinking oil companies, stinking oil companies. But what gives them the power to do what they want to do? The government does. It's the government monopolies that are the problem. Not, I mean, if you had free entry, if anyone could come into business, any uh, as many dentists you wanted, many veterinarians, however you wanted to do it, then you wouldn't have the monopoly. Service would have to get better or you'd go out of business, and prices would have to come down to the consumer or you'd go out of business. Yeah, and the but as long as you have monopoly. Have, yeah, and the politicians have found that those who want monopolies will support those politicians to guarantee they get them. Oh, yeah. They're, they're going to pay for them to get elected. Okay. Thank you. Thanks well, for the call. It's, our system's compounded by the fact that not only did we give Congress the power to tax us, right? But we also unilaterally gave them the power to create law. But not there is no in America, there is no set standard for law. I mean, all through history, 
law progressed as what became common, right? Like here, here we can look back and see what law was. We can look back even more and see what law was and see a progression of law all the way up till you get to America. And when you get to America, since Congress had the power to create law, you see a never-ending plethora of paper laws, right? All right, positive laws. There is, I mean, look at how many laws are on the book. It's it's a joke. Every everybody thinks it's a joke. How many laws we have? Well, we've talked about it before. Two hundred fifty thousand laws a year nationwide, with at least ten regulations added to that. So you have about two point five million. Because regulations, we know, even though they're not voted on by a Congress, they still put you in jail. They still get you put in jail. So you're not represented. You're not represented when those laws are made. But they hold the force of law. Pretty sure me and Smitty broke some laws last night. There you go. <laughs> it's very possible. But they, yeah. So this whole thing where we have a representative form of government, we we try to say that. But who makes the laws? I mean, the EPA, they're a body that I've never got to vote on. I don't know anyone that's got to vote on the EPA or anyone that's in charge of the EPA. I don't know anyone that gets to vote on the laws that they pass. I don't know anyone that gets to vote them out of office, supposedly, whatever, out of uh, business. But they get to pass law and force it on you. If you don't like it, you can go to jail or be shot, whichever you choose. Our, our, our system encourages the max amount of stealing in the least amount of time. And to simplify that concept for people that aren't getting what you were saying before I got here, every... Uh, Here's a good example. Nationwide, you have, um, if you're a gun dealer or a surplus dealer or whatever like I am, if you want to go buy a gun right now, it's almost impossible. Every uh, website out there that sells AR-15s and light components, they're, as soon as you come on their website, they have big old red letters telling you that it's going to be 12 to 24 weeks before, you can, before you're going to see anything that you order, right? And why is that going on? You have that going on with your ammo. You have it going on with um, all military supplies in general. And it's because there's a chance that Obama might get elected again. Right? So, you, I mean, we have people coming in every day, buying up everything that we have to, to the point where the store almost doesn't have anything in it. Because Obama might get elected. So everybody sits there and admits that he just had four years and if he only has four more years, then he's probably going to go nuts, right? So everybody has this concept that the less amount of time that he has, the more he's going to take. The more he's going to steal. Right, so everybody accepts that in their mind, but they don't think that about everybody in broad terms. They only think it about whoever they happen to feel threatened by. Obama. But it's the system that creates that, not Obama. So... I mean, the funniest thing to me of all is you have a whole group out there that tends to be uh, Republican and right-wing that uh, keeps screaming for term limits, right? They want term limits, but in the same breath, they'll say that we all need to panic because if Obama gets in, he, he'll only have four years left, so he's definitely going to tear everything up. Right, so what you're saying is term limits basically encourage the thief... To steal quicker. Right. The less the less amount of time that uh, a person has in office, the more destructive they're going to be. Right. We've talked about before with uh, the monarch. The monarch was planning on being there his whole life. So it was in his best interest to, while he owned everything, he wanted to gather more for whoever he was going to turn it over to, pre preferably his son, he thought. But he knew that since he was going to be there for a long time, he couldn't steal to the point where he destroyed his country, or if he was smart, he wouldn't. Uh, there was the chance that he might be removed from office forcibly if he did that, which we see in the American Revolution. But because, so, hang on, because under that system, there's only one person in the whole world, as far as your country goes, that can steal from you property-wise. Right. He has to be careful because it's not broadened out to everybody possibly. Right, not everyone person. can steal from you, just the king. So he has to be careful how he steals, otherwise you have It's because the whole country is looking at him with suspicion. And on the other hand, when you have presidents, Congress, stuff like that, they don't care. None of it belongs to them. 
but as much as they can steal in the process or give to their constituents by stealing, they're going to do. And they know I have four years, I have two years, I have six years, however many years they have. They have nothing future-wise since they're only going to be there for a while. They don't have to worry about the future. Well, how's my son going to take over? How's my son going to do when he takes over? Because the son may not ever take over. So he's got a limited amount of time to steal before he's out of office. So he has no interest in taking care of the country because basically he's there to get for himself and he's there to get for the people that put him in office. And, and we all know they're all, they all promise something. And as, as far as our three branches of government go, they essentially um, make the problem worse, not better. As you have each one validating the other, you have uh, Congress appoints, or you have presidents that appoint the judges, and then Congress um, approves of them, right? Right. And each one, in turn, validates the other. You're not going to have a bunch of judges um, decide that all the laws that Congress make are no good. Right. Congress controls their checkbook. Exactly. That's my favorite part. <laughs> Right, so the problem with the, uh, so you have a judiciary or a Supreme Court, which uh, Thomas Jefferson thought was an absolute horrible idea because he said we shouldn't have those. We should have people's courts, basically juries decide matters. Juries should decide whether laws should be constitutional or not. Instead, what we have is a bunch of judges, nine of them, who decide whether or not the masters that actually pay their paycheck are doing the right thing or not. So... First, you get appointed by a president. Do you really want to piss him off? Then really. you get confirmed by a Senate. Do you want to piss them off? Not really. They have the, your checkbook. So it's in your best interest to, for the judges to go along with Congress, to go along with the president. It's in their best interest to do that because the bigger that Congress gets, the bigger, more power the president gets, the more power the judges get. There's no check and balance. The check and balance is worthless. It's like when you go to court. You're going there to get a get justice from a judge that gets paid by the state to uphold state laws and an officer that's paid by the state to uphold state laws and a prosecution that gets paid by the state to uphold state laws. So all these guys are getting a paycheck from the same place. So how are you really expecting to get justice by going into that? Committee. <laughs> you're supposedly, asking me? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> supposedly, seriously. you're supposed to be able to have a jury, which is what we were supposed to have. Right, but a, then the jury gets instructed that it's their duty to judge the facts in the case as they're presented to them, not the to that, judge the law. And uphold the law the way that the judge tells So them. if the ju jury's only job is to judge the facts as they're presented to them, right, then what is the point of a jury at all? If the jury isn't there to judge the law then they're not even needed. I mean, what what really, was, what would they be needed for? How come a judge couldn't do the exact same thing that a jury could do? Well, just put all the facts into a computer, and whoever has the balance, whatever goes over 50%, that's the way it should be decided, right? Or yeah, the facts are. It'd be just as accurate. I mean, it'd be more it'd accurate. It'd be cheaper. It'd be more accurate, but not correct. All right, so down there in, like, take the Schaefer-Cox trial, all those guys decided that... Yes, Schaefer Cox, Coleman Barney, and Lonnie Vernon were all, um, well, I guess not Coleman Barney, but you know what I mean. They're guilty of conspiracy to murder, right? right? And they were guilty of firearms violations and numerous other counts, but not one of them took the precedence of the law into account at all. So all they did was judge the facts as they were presented to them. They said, okay, here's... Here's what we say happened. Here's what they say happened. You guys decide which one happened. The idea, the ideology of the law coming into question at all, never even got presented. Right. Did the did the federal government have the right to come in here and put all these people into Schaefer Cox's life and help push him down a path that could put him in jail? I mean. Does the Constitution guarantee the right to keep and bear arms? Does if exactly. so, I mean, it says that uh, shall not be infringed. What does that mean? Why didn't a juror 
on that jury decide that who cares if they actually did have a machine gun? Who cares if they actually had a silencer? They're right. protected. If it's I would have been right. on that jury, I would have said, I'm I would not have argued it. the fact of whether he did have a machine gun or not. I would have said, why can't he have Why one? can't he have a machine gun? Not only why can't he, he should be able to. And the greatest part about the way our system is set up, the only, in my opinion, the only good thing about the way our system set up is if one juror would have said that... Done. <sighs> it would have been over. It would have been over. I thought it was pretty interesting, too, in the case. I know we're jumping all over, but since you brought that up, <laughs> how they were found guilty to of conspiracy to murder, but the ones that they were found guilty to murder never actually existed. Because the ones that they said that they were going to murder was this hit team, supposedly. Yeah, squad the federal hit Colorado squad from Colorado that, that they didn't admitted exist. didn't exist, but they got. But two guys were found guilty, guilty of conspiracy to murder to murder them people that don't exist. So basically, what that means is if you say I'm going to kill some aliens if they ever come here from Mars, you could be thrown in jail. What if they're federal aliens? I don't know. Well, anyways, so basically you can say anything you want, even if it doesn't exist. You can say, I'm going to kill a Sasquatch if I see it, and you can basically go to jail for it because even though they may not exist. That's even not true, Josh. It would have to pro- be a federal Sasquatch. Federal Sasquatch. Well, why does that have to be a federal? I mean, you could just say they you're have more kill money. Anyone. No, you could kill anyone. You could say you're going to kill anything. No, that's not true. I, I'm pretty – I would venture to assume that if Schaefer Cox was running around talking about waging war on um, just people in Fairbanks, he wouldn't be in jail right now. Mm, I don't know. He wouldn't have got conspiracy to murder. The point is, though, there was no one. The people that they found him guilty of conspiring to murder do not exist. I don't How was think a lot of people that Schaefer Cox talked about existed. No, right, but that's beside the point, whether any of that. The point is that they were found guilty conspiring to murder people that do not exist. And that brings up the whole thing about self-defense. So, I mean, they said flat out they weren't going to shoot unless fired on, Right. Right. If they're if it was plain clothes and they were actually shot at, they would return fire. So right. If the federal hit team from Colorado showed up, they were going and tried to do something, they would have fought back. That was the plan. So they got conspiracy to murder a federal hit team that didn't exist, that never showed up. That didn't do anything. That don't exist, basically. They don't exist. Doesn't matter. Let's gosh, let's hit the phones. All right. Uh, hi, you're on the air. Yeah, like you were just said in a roundabout way there, um, Schaefer Cox and them, if they were tried up here in Fairbanks instead of Anchorage, they wouldn't have been no convictions, I don't think at all. Maybe one charge, but that's about it. I don't believe that. Uh, I don't know. I kind of tend to believe that they wouldn't have been either. But the, that brings up a really good point. I mean, you're guaranteed to be uh, tried by a jury of your peers in the uh, district, or not the district, but the... Uh, what is it called? The air, basically the area that you lived or the area that the crime was committed. And that brings up a good question about what is a peer. And, I mean, the federal government said, well, you know, the, they were the same district, basically. The Ninth Judicial District, I think, is how they played that off. So they could take them basically anywhere they wanted, which is funny. In the Declaration of Independence, one of the things Jefferson said is that one of the grievances they had with the king was that they take us to foreign jurisdictions to try us for things that, whatever that the king didn't like so the jurisdiction that schaefer cox and them should have been tried on is right here and they were supposed to be tried by by a jury of their peers and they say that now they say well a peer is anyone that we go out and pick that's not true if you look at the original intent if you read john adams if you read spooner any of those guys they talk about the fact that your peer is people that know you that is who you're supposed to be tried by right and the government separates the peer as anybody that's not government not no not, not even anyone. necessarily no because that. they throw lots they throw in as many government employees as they can on the jury. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fact. I mean, it's not something that you know what I mean. Not somebody that's not in in a hierarchy position. I mean, you're not going to have a law enforcement person on the jury necessarily. Right. Well, they get 
avoid deer it off or whatever it is. But my my point wasn't that um, I I still disagree that Schaefer Cox would have got let go because the judge would have demanded that they judge the facts as they were presented to him, right? right? So if they were to judge the facts without taking the law into account at all, and you were just going to judge the facts, the jury here would have came up with the same verdict because they were judging facts as they were presented to him. And the facts as they were presented to him is that they conspired to murder. Well, maybe not. They did conspire to murder people that don't exist from an alien planet. Did they conspire to murder or provide self-defense? Well, they're supposed to judge the facts as they were presented to him, right? Right. And the way that they were presented to him is that they conspired to murder. Does that even make sense? Sure. It does if you're the government. Well, I'm saying if you're supposed to judge the facts as they're presented to you and the state presents them as you are this, then they judge the facts as they're presented to them and they pronounce them guilty. Justice in America. All right, right. we got to take a quick break for the news. We'll be back. Keep going. All right. Let's uh, take some more phone calls here. All right, 458-TALK. Hi, you're on the air. Hello? Mm, How about now? Might have lost one. Let's try this one. Hello? Yeah, we are programmed to not to question authority. Uh, people, uh, I found when I've been on the uh, Pittsburgh jury duty, uh, people that are the 12 juries, jurors that are sitting along with me uh, did not question whether or not the officer who said that the person that was driving at a point zero eight and point uh, zero eight is considered to be uh, uh, intoxicated right. under the influence and you can get a ticket mm-hmm. well Nobody wanted to question the fact that there was uh, that the uh, breathalyzer was out of date, and they said, "Well, either way, you got a three percent, or actually, it's a six percent of either it going uh, plus or minus six percent, plus or minus six percent." And people didn't understand what that meant. Okay. What that meant was that it could have an error of 6%, right. uh, plus or minus. But the fact that the police officer gave him a ticket for a point zero eight. Now, you can get a point zero eight with mouthwash, okay? You can get a point zero eight with some toothbrushes and toothpastes that, that have alcohol in them, and then... Uh, if you if it's just fresh in your mouth or you know anyway it's an easy thing to get because even a half a beer or not even a full bottle of beer will give you a point zero eight if you just drank it and right. then blew okay did, did the uh, find him guilty no because I found that the uh, the the breathalyzer was not calibrated it uh, oh, so they, you, it was out of date you so dissented. I yes, I contempted the uh, the fact, and I I convinced the jury that we had to vote not guilty because the calibration was out of date by 24 hours. Nice. Well, good job. So thank I, you. I got them off, but the problem is, is that most of them said that. Because the officer said he was guilty, he was guilty. Right. And I said, that's not the way it works. Well, where do we learn that? Okay, we have to, we have to to decipher the laws, and they're saying, no, we don't decipher the laws. We, I mean, we don't interpret the laws, we just uh, decipher the laws. Right, which is absolutely opposite of what the whole point of the jury is. The point of the jury is to... Decide whether the law is just or not, and if it's not, right. If, don't that, if that wasn't the purpose of the jury, there's no reason for a jury at all. I mean, if you really think about it, what reason was there for a jury? But with the Schaefer Cox deal, it doesn't matter. They found him guilty because we, as a society, that we are we are programmed not to question authority. Uh, fuck authority. Right. So therefore, if the cop says you're going 75 miles an hour. 
and your speedometer says 55, unless you go to trial, and I mean, and, yeah, unless you go to trial and prove your innocence, you're found guilty no matter what. Right. Just Presumptions look, are the absolute opposite. You're presumed guilty until proven look innocent. At, look at the nature of the ticket. They give you a ticket that you're supposed to pay, and if you want, you can go ahead and take it to court. I mean, you're guilty the second you get the ticket. Just pay up. Because the officer said so, which is, but why, why, I mean, let's get deep on this one. Why do we, why don't we question authority? Where do we learn that? We learn that from school. school. You're sent to public school. school. That's right. Your teacher tells you that if you don't do as I say, you're going to go to the principal. That's right. And if you, and if you don't do it my way, it's, uh, you're going to be suspended and then your parents is going to, you know, hopefully spank your butt. But most of the times they don't. So we're taught, we're taught from the very first moment we go to school, obey the teacher without any, don't question anything they say. That's why we always say it's not public education, it's public indoctrination. Because all through your school years, you're taught... But the other thing is that they reward you for bad behavior. If you go ahead and you do it like I say, if you just, if you just... Put down the answer. I'll put down the answer. Okay, here. But I'll put down the answer. But you have to promise me that you'll go home and try and figure it out on your own. But I'm going to give you the answer. So they reward you for bad behavior. And and again, what what does that do to the child's mind? The child's mind says that, well, if I if I follow the direction, even though they they it's wrong, I get rewarded for it because I pass. You know, I get my pass. That's all I want is my pass so I get out of school. That's all I want. So do you think that if uh, the jury in the Schaefer-Cox trial would have judged the law, that it would have came out differently? If the people knew what the law was, if the people knew I, what the I, law, how the law works, if, if people knew how, how could anybody law, know how the law works when there's how many? Well, you can go to the library. I got books on it at home. I th- there's no way anybody works. could understand how the law works when you have a when you have a fluid law like we do. You have an, an, an ever changing law structure through paper laws. It's not even possible to understand law. Yeah, the old adage of. Uh... Ignorance of the laws, no excuse, doesn't even apply today because there's so many stinking laws. That was based on common law. Everyone knew common law because it was simple. You do everything you agree to do, and you don't harm anyone's property or person. That's. Do you know what? Do you know what a fiduciary duty means? Do you know what a fiduciary duty means? Go ahead. A fiduciary duty means that you that when someone represents you, they mm-hmm. have a right. To represent you in in a way that is uh, uh, in respect of the law. Okay, so in other words, if you're not being represented uh, in your in within the law, if they don't represent you, then you can end up turn around and suing them for not representing you properly. Because uh, it, they owe you a fiduciary a duty to do this. So it's been done and it's been tried and it's been won. So I'm telling you that be, because Schaefer Cox had a, uh, and he had a really good uh, public defender, by the way. I think he they was did the paying. best they could. Right. But a public defender wasn't good enough. He didn't do them justice. By he didn't do the fiduciary well, that's duty just more, like he should have. Right. We're gonna we got to get moving along here, but that's just more the problem with the whole system. I mean, you're basically saying whoever talks the best game gets off or gets convicted. Whoever talks the best game wins, which is why this thing is so screwed up in the first place. And you can't know what all the laws are. The jury doesn't know what all the laws are. There was, They even admitted that the conspiracy is so convoluted you could come up with whatever end that you wanted to come up with. The point is, you shouldn't have the law in the first place. Well, it wouldn't matter if the law was all over the place or if it was convoluted or any of those things. The jury exercised their duty right. to judge the law. And Not just their out. right. It's their duty. Yes. 
Yeah, it's it, it's kind of like you guys were talking about earlier. The the whole cr- purpose of the creation of the jury is not so that you have a bunch of people who are really well versed in what law is. The whole point of what the jury was to be in the first place is to say whether the law should exist in the first place. Right. right. In fact, it would be better if they weren't well versed in what the law is. Well, so they can see it from the third person. The fact that and they by the way, that's underst- Abe Tolman. He just showed up here. Whoop, whoop. Hey, what's up, guys? The fact that the law is so convoluted that they admitted, well, this law is so convoluted you can come up with any interpretation, automatically the jury should say, then it's not a law. Yeah. It's out. Strike it. Right. I, Which uh, is their right the and duty to do. the basically said that, right. or no, the judge, the judge is the one that said it's all, so all over the place with the conspiracy. Right. So what is the, the basically the judge gets to decide with the help of the prosecution what end that law is going to be, and then demand that the jury come out. Well, of course, they don't outright demand, but they do, pretty much. You will follow the law the way that we tell you it's going to be. The jury didn't do their duty. If the jury did their duty, they would have said, this law's a piece of crap, it's gone, not guilty. They would have definitely laughed at the conspiracy to murder people that didn't exist. Right. They should have thrown the conspiracy charge out and mocked it, and mock the judge while you're at it, because I'm all about mocking those kind of people. And then, the whole thing with the... Uh, Second Amendment issue, the guns and all that, who says that he can't own a firearm? Who says he can't own a machine gun? He has a basic natural right to own whatever he wants, as long as he doesn't hurt anyone else. Is there an injured party? They never could produce an injured party, so why are they in jail? I think the only group that actually cares about whether or not he owns silencers or machine guns or what what are they called? What kind of weapons are they? Aaron. The Hornet's Nest? Weapons of Mass Destruction? Sure, Weapons of Mass Destruction. It's not actually uh, your neighbor because, I mean, if my neighbor owned a machine gun, I, you know, the only thing that I would think about was, hmm, maybe I should get one too. So if he goes crazy, at least I have some protection from him. Actually, you'd probably be over there asking if you could try it. Yeah, yeah, no yeah that's, that's, that's more than likely true. But the bottom line is, is the only people who are even remotely worried about Schaefer or any of his buddies owning machine guns is the government because... They're the only ones who stand to lose if, you know, if a bunch of people band together with these automatic weapons that are quote unquote illegal and say, hey, guys, uh, you you can't push us around. Just keep taking our stuff anymore. Right. They don't like an even playing field. Yeah, no. You guys can have this and we can have that. Anyways, we got a hotline. Let's take them. What? All right. You're on the air. Hi, this is Josh. Hey, man. How's it going? Going well. (laughs) It's going well. I just wanted to... uh kind of throw in my two cents on the whole Schaefer Cox thing. Nice. Um, I know Schaefer personally, a lot of us do, and, you know, he's the way he is or whatever, but one thing that's really interesting about this case, his case, is that it's not really about weapons or anything else. It's a First Amendment case in that um, yeah. he was arrested because he said things. He wasn't arrested because he did things. He wasn't arrested for, and like you said, yeah, the Second even, Amendment. Yeah, even the prosecution came right out and said that. Yeah. And uh, there's this uh, legal test. It's from a case back in the 60s called United States Supreme Court versus Brandenburg. Uh, Brandenburg v. Ohio, I mean, I'm sorry. And uh, it's called the Imminent Lawless Action Test. And it basically says you can say whatever you want unless, and you're not going to get in trouble for that unless it, you can make it, the, the prosecutors can prove you're going to commit this action imminently and you actually have the ability to do it. So, like, if I said I was going to go take over the United States government by myself with a pitchfork, you know, even if I was going to do it imminently, I didn't have the ability to do it. So it was just, you know, crazy talk. So they just ignore it. So I'm not going to go to prison for saying something like that. But that's basically what happened here, is that, you know, Schaefer said a lot of stuff. You know, his intent was questionable. His means were, were questionable. The whole thing was, was pretty much bunk. So. Well, the means were absolutely, they weren't there. He didn't have the means to do what he was talking about. I mean, that was proved over and over and over. People mocked him for that part of it. And the whole thing, I mean, if the jury had half a brain, they would have thought about the whole free speech part about it and thought, hmm, the way I'm going to decide right now is going to give this federal government more power to go down these roads. Or they could have nipped it in the bud and said, no, you know what, we might not like Schaefer Cox, we might not like the stuff he said or this or that, he might be a weirdo, but by finding him guilty... We're going to give this federal government more power to go down this road and take away even more rights. By finding him not guilty, they would have been telling the FBI and the federal government, stop. You're not going to do this crap in this state. Right. And but they basically gave him a free free pass. I mean, even the I guarantee the prosecution, the FBI, they're thinking about that. I know that the defense attorneys were thinking that, that this was a ver- the importance of the case wasn't Schaefer Cox. It was for us. 
what did we give them the right to do, basically, by rolling over for them? Yeah, and the jury may not know better, and that's why I don't buy into the whole system, really, because you have a system that relies on the jury understanding that they're being flummoxed or whatever. But all the legal team on both sides, and the, and the judge included, everyone gets really sketchy with conspiracy trials because you're basically arresting people who haven't done anything wrong yet. And you have to prove so convincingly that they're actually definitely going to do it and it's going to be the worst thing ever, so we have to arrest them before they do anything wrong. Um, they're mm-hmm. called inchoate crimes. Uh, possession of drugs is an inchoate crime. You Basically, you have something, you haven't hurt anybody with it, but in theory that if you do something with it, it hurts people. Like a, They're basically crimes that you get arrested for before you do anything, any harm. And they're totally bunk, and they didn't exist really more than you know 100 years ago they're, they're all the rage now though obviously but, oh yeah because the state um, benefits from them quite well oh yeah totally Mon- monetarily uh the prison system benefits from it yeah obviously. yeah and like with a uh, civil asset forfeiture if you, remember, you guys never heard about this if you haven't you should google there's some good videos about it but it's basically where the cops will arrest you and or or just take your money arrest you and or take your money because they think you might use it in a crime you know, so basically, if you've got ten grand on you and you're on a state highway, you can just be stopped. And that happened. That I know that for a fact. That happened to me. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. And it's totally bunk. And the reason they're doing it is because you are likely to commit a crime with that money, and you have. They don't even have to prove intent. Just the fact that you have accumulated a certain amount of pieces of paper in a small area means that you are a criminal, and they need to stop you by taking that away from you, but not arresting you, because they can't prove any crime, but they can prove intent. I, I got, people probably aren't even going to believe this, but I got pulled over one time, and uh, when I had a business in Anchorage, I owned a construction business, always had a lot of cash, um, mainly because my guys would always take draws from me, so I always had to have cash on me, but uh, I got pulled over just right down the road from my job site, and I had about $2,400 in cash on me, and they gave me a bunch of grief about having so much cash, and ultimately they ended up um, taking it from me, and they said that I could come back down and get it, but they were taking it because they're not, they weren't 100% sure that I didn't have that much amount of money to, because I may have been going to commit a crime with it. I mean, that's basically what they said to me. Yeah. So they seized it from me, but when I went to go get it back, they didn't have any clue what I was talking about. I never, ever did get that money back. Right. Surprise, and, surprise, surprise. And in, in, in the cases where they do actually uh, write it up and you can go get it, they're not writing charges against you. So you have to, you can't go to the court and testify as a, as a uh, defendant and say, hey, this guy, this cop took my money, I need to get it back. You have to testify as a witness in a case where the, it's called the state v. your $2,400. The state, this is actually, you can look it up anywhere, in all these civil asset cases, the state is actually prosecuting your money or your property. And they'll say that. They'll say, you know, Louisiana versus some dude's car, you know, or something like that. And you have to go as a witness saying, I'm actually the owner of some dude's car, and I'd like to get it back. So you're basically uh, a witness to say that the money by itself was not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, it's a guilty until proven innocent thing, because your money can't no represent way. itself super well. Especially You're guilty of proven your money. innocent? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no joke. So, I mean, and it's the whole thing. And it's all these in Kuwait crimes, including Schaefer's deal and drug stuff and civil asset forfeiture. It's all a new thing, and it's sneaking into the public consciousness as a thing that's okay. You know, like, soon you'll have people say, oh, you shouldn't carry that much money on you. You know, you could be committing a crime with it. So, like, people start making excuses for the state, and that's the scary thing. Is that, that is scary. You have people not doing anything wrong, but are still being judged... Um, as criminals by the people because um, they crossed these immaculate automatic legitimacy granters, which are the cops. You know, they're the ones who get to decide what's right and what's wrong. And if you cross them, you're automatically wrong. Right. And what's funny about that, you hit it right on the head. It's not the fact that government does that because, sure, we expect it. They're crooks. I mean, the reason for government is to steal. It's organized crime. The sad part is, and the scary part, is when the people, the citizens, back them up. And approve of it and give their consent of it and just say, well, you know, like the other caller was saying, if they said it, then you must be doing it. Mm-hmm. If they accuse you, then you must be guilty. Well, what? the opposite needs to happen. Juries need to just set people free for the heck of it just to tell the government to knock it off. Back off. We're in control. But they're not going to do that. I mean, 
you don't have to be smart either to figure this out on a jury. All you have to do is just say, I don't like the government. Mm, eh, I'm not guilty. <laughs> yeah, it's not I a matter of state. intelligence. It's a matter of self-respect. Yes, and it's exactly. It's a problem that Americans have pretty bad. And I didn't realize how, how specific to our imaginary borders it was until I was in Mexico several months ago. Right. And the people just wouldn't put up with it. Like, Mexico has plenty of problems, but they're not related to uh, people over-respecting cops, certainly. Like, when cops would get a little handsy because they're given bazillions of dollars by the U.S. government to find drugs, people just would freak out. It just wasn't going to happen. It's like, no way. Go away. I don't respect you. Get the hell out of here. It just wasn't, it wasn't a thing they put up with. So The self-respect part, that's excellent because when you're sitting on that jury, you're basically saying that you yourself don't have enough respect for yourself that this law, this whatever, this charge against this other person should apply to you also. Absolutely. You should go to jail also. So where's your self-respect in that? Are you saying that you're not a worthy being? You can't take care of yourself? You're basically, you should just be thrown in jail. I mean, because at any point in time, you could create or commit a, a crime or you a felony. You a crime for wanting to kill Martians that don't exist. You might have committed, more than likely, you committed a crime on the way to the jury trial. Absolutely. When you drove into town. There's no doubt about it. When you woke up, by the time you got to your car, you probably committed a crime. So you're basically, when you're finding that guy guilty, you're finding yourself guilty, too. You have no self-respect. You're saying that the government is the supreme being. The government is your god. And you will give fealty to that God, no matter what it says, you will obey it and agree with it. Mm -hmm. I'm not of that persuasion myself. <laughs> I do what? Do what? Anyway, you got anything else, man? No, that's it. All right, thanks for the call, bro. Sure thing. Hi, you're on the air. Let's Where try are this are you? Hello? Go, hey. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, the thing with Schaefer Cox, I mean, this is quite a bit of difference between, uh, you know, threatening to kill a Martian and threatening to kill a federal judge. I mean, uh, what, what's the guy Schaefer got to Cox, do? Schaefer Cox, no. He wasn't found guilty of conspiring to kill a judge. He was found guilty of conspiring to murder a, a hit team from Colorado that did not exist. Well, what I, what I understood about the thing from the newspaper... Uh, is basically it was a state troopers and a, and a judge. No, that's not what he... Um... No, they actually, that was thrown, basically thrown out, and the new charge was conspiring to murder the group that didn't exist from Colorado. Right, and the prosecution actually brought that out of nowhere. I mean, I, I'm not saying that the, the supposition as it was presented didn't happen, but what I'm saying is, is the prosecution offered the defense um, uh, a plea deal, and when they didn't take it, they came back at him and said, if you don't take it, we're going to try you. Uh, we're going to throw this extra charge on there of conspiring to kill um, the peop this hit team from Colorado. Right, because when they were and originally they, they presented arrested... the whole thing to him like that, and they still refused the plea deal, and they ended up... They're going to possibly spend life in jail for not taking a plea deal is what it comes down to. Right, because they originally were not charged with conspiring to murder. No, they, originally, that, that, that charge that came charge. because they refused to take a plea deal. The original this charge like extortion was... extortion to me. What? Ext the government? Extorting? The original, the original charges were weapons charges, and they brought a plea deal to him and said, plea out and we'll give you blah, blah, blah. And they said, no way. They said, well, you're going to plea out or we're going to charge you with conspiracy. And they said, go for it. You're never going to prove that. There was no conspiracy. Well, what, what about the kangaroo court thing in Denny's? That doesn't have anything to do with what happened in Anchorage, though. I mean, that's just free like, speech, He's going to get life in prison. We could all go down to Denny's right now and have a little kangaroo court. No, we couldn't. Because what? we'd all get life in jail. Oh, right. But I'm saying anyone could do that. Guys sitting down there having breakfast right now could just say, up oh, court's in, you know, we're having court now, blah, blah court's in session, yada, 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 and, and they're done, whatever. Who cares what he did at Denny's? Was it smart? No, it's kind of, that might have been dumb. What he well, said that in the courtroom? That, that, was, that, was, that was the basic, that was the basic, uh. He, he was not tried. He was not tried any way, shape, or form for what happened at Denny's. That was just throwing around a whole bunch to make him look even more stupid in the eyes of the jury. Yeah, our local newspaper and well, actually all the newspapers did a pretty good job of convoluting the whole story. He was found guilty. The conspiracy charge had nothing to do with a state trooper, nothing to do with a judge, nothing to do with anything that we all thought it was. 
And remember, they were never originally um, put on trial for conspiracy. That was a state charge, and the state threw it out. They were brought up. They were found guilty of conspiring to murder a federal hit team that Schaefer Cox made up in his mind that yeah. did not exist. That's who the jury. That's how they got found guilty was to conspire to murder a hit team that did not exist. None yeah, that's why people... all all of the charges revolve around KJMP. They don't they don't talk about um, him threatening the judge. Um, I mean, that he wasn't he wasn't there was no charges against him. For threatening to kill a judge, there's no charges against him for threatening to kill um, troopers or anything like that. The conspiracy to murder charge, as it was presented to the jury, was for killing a federal hit team from Colorado at KJMP. Well, I guess I guess I didn't read the article right. No, well, you. No, I read. I read the articles too, and uh, like I was saying, not saying that. You know, not blaming you for anything. What I'm saying is that the way that the paper wrote it up is so convoluted, it, but it's wrong. The way they were actually found guilty and what they were found guilty of wasn't really explained in the paper. I mean, we we're made to find because the only reason I know well, is because I know people. It was that were explained in the paper, but the paper talks about all the other events that happened. But he wasn't oh. tried for any of those. The paper just likes to make it a big long story, you know. But as far as what he was tried and found guilty for was conspiracy to murder a federal hit team from Colorado that didn't exist at KJMP in the evening that he was there on the radio. Just out of curiosity, what do you think about the weapons charges? Do you agree with those? About what? The weapons charges? Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a big gun person. I don't really... I, I think you got the right to own a gun, but, you know... Okay, that's uh, fair enough. You know, but... You know, a lot of that stuff. Was, yeah, you guys got silencers. I mean, I don't own a gun to go hunting with, but I don't go hunting, hunting other people and talking about hunting other people. Right. And that's kind of, you know, it's, it's a shame the guy's a young guy you know, served life in prison for that. Yeah. Probably needs some mental health counseling more than it does. So, so I got I got a question. Do you think that the whole purpose of the Second Amendment is for our right to go hunting, or do you actually believe that maybe it existed so that we could defend ourselves from people who form governments above us to come and take our property and put words in our mouth and say that we conspire to kill and pretend SWAT teams from Colorado? Oh, uh, I don't like I said. I don't even own a gun. I don't even know how to answer that one. one. All right, man. Well, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Hi, you're on the air. Yeah, this is Chris. Go ahead, Chris. We've got one minute. Yeah, Yeah, okay. Well, you know, the the weapons charges, uh, my my question is, is is he guilty of possessing firearms that he shouldn't have, or is he guilty of not paying taxes on those firearms? He's guilty of not paying taxes on those firearms. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's the way I see it. So, you know, it's just... uh, that you know, that's he, not that's not what his life so, just so got really ended for over though. His life got no, ended. No, I, but go I, ahead. I understand that, but uh, it is ridiculous. I'm, just, I'm just making a point about the firearms though. Is that you sure. know he's he's guilty of not paying taxes. Right. You can that, get ten that, years in jail for not paying a two hundred dollar tax. Actually, one of those is only a fifty dollar tax. <laughs> Good morning, Patriots Lament. It's Josh Bennett here. We got Aaron Bennett. In the studio with us, and Mr. Abe Pullman joining us. Steve Floyd's out, as you guys probably all know. Mr. Geisel is nowhere to be found, never again. But we got Smitty running the board for us, and we thank you again, Smitty, for coming in. Appreciate it. And uh, let's just see if those guys stayed on. If they were kind enough to stay on, we'll be kind enough to ask. All right. Hi, you're on the. Mm, Nope. Hello? You there? All right, let's try this one. Hi, you're on the air. Yeah, this is Chris again. Hey, Chris. Hey, uh, I, well, I wanted to say, you know, I, I called in your last hour there at the end of it. Yeah. Minute, but the, uh, so, so he's guilty of not paying taxes, Schaefer Cox is. Now, that, that leads me down the road of, uh, I think it was Aaron said he, uh, the police stole $2,400 from him in Anchorage. Yeah. Yes. Now, now, what, 
what you'd be guilty of of having twenty four hundred dollars cash on you is that you might be able to make a non traceable transaction, and those police might not actually be able to get their income paid because you might not pay taxes. <laughs> no, that's true. That's, cash. I mean, it, it, it basically, it, it, you know, most of it boils down to that, and the the absurdity of uh, threatening to kill some someone or something that doesn't exist is just, that's just. Uh, well, see, I had, a, I had a concealed, I had a concealed firearm, and they said that the two together um, constituted what could be construed as a crime. Well, if you got twenty four hundred dollars worth of cash, you might want to have a concealed firearm, though. What? Oh, sure, you're guilty of protecting yourself. Aha. Uh-huh. So they if you um, do that. You don't need police. They confiscated my weapon, also, and I was able to go back down and get my weapon. Um, from property, but the money they just drew a blank on. I um, never ever got that money back. Yeah, sure, because they knew you probably didn't write down the serial numbers for the bill. Some local uh, yeah, yeah, donut yeah. shop did pretty well that week, though. Yeah, you, you know, you have a serial number for the firearm, more than likely. Right. Most people know those where they keep them on them, anyways. So, so you have uh, some sort of proof of ownership there, but uh, when it comes to cash, I mean, who wants to sit down and write down all the serial numbers on all your bills? You know, the greatest part about that was, is well, there was nothing great about it because I was out of hell a lot of money. The greatest part about it was that there was three officers there, and one of the officers protested them doing that, and they got in a fight over it right in front of me. <laughs> wow. So well, you can't sure. you can't tell me that it was some kind of law of some kind, or one of the officers wouldn't have protested to it. They went back and forth for a good minute, minute and a half about whether they should take it or not. One of the officers was like, I mean, he just flat said, we really have no business taking his money. Yeah, yeah well, let's do it anyway. Yeah. So do you think, uh, as far as the weapons charges, do you, do you agree with those weapons charges because he didn't pay his tax? Do you think he should be found guilty Ab- for that? Absolutely not. Cool. Uh, but my point by saying that, I was it, it's, it's actually, a constitutional issue. what I wanted to finish there was if the law enforcement officers were arguing over whether they should take my money or not, so are they basically the judge, the jury, the law, the whole nine yards? Uh, yeah. Or where, why would there even be an issue over whether they should or shouldn't? I want to go jumping back something that you just said with the uh, firearms thing. You said it's a constitutional issue. What if they pass a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Second Amendment? Uh, then, uh, that would be uh, that would be an unconstitutional act against the Second Amendment. No, if if they pass, I mean, uh, an, if, if, if they pass, it will not be infringed. So therefore, that I believe that statement right there says that uh, mm-hmm. there will be no other constitutional amendment to uh, discredit the. The, the second. But they have the right. The Constitution gives Congress the right to have a convention and change the Constitution. They can add an amendment if three, two-thirds of the states say that they can pull the Second Amendment out of it. They can do that according to the Constitution. They have the quote-unquote right to do that. What I'm saying is, whether it's in the Constitution or not, is it your right? Yes, it's your right. There you go. Right. we got to get away from worrying about whether something's a constitutional right because that piece of paper does not give us rights. If it does, we're screwed because about eight of the ten amendments are gone. The only ones left are, yeah, I don't even think there are any That's left. So if we're going to rely on... If we're going to rely on saying, well, it's a constitutional right, it's just got to get out of our vocabulary. It's our right. Whether you guys say it is or not has no meaning to me. Whether you guys want to change the Constitution, I mean, look at the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth Amendment. All those amendments with the uh, the uh, Patriot Acts, with the uh, Indefinite NDAA. Detention Act, all those things, they're saying, well, whatever, whether it's your constitutional right, we found a way to get around it or we don't care about it. The it's not the fact that it's a constitutional right. That has to get out of our vocabulary, and it has to just be, it's my right as a human to own a firearm to protect myself against right. whoever I need to protect myself against. Point in case would be the state dropped the charges against Schaefer Cox because it was constitutionally illegal for him to be secretly recorded in the state of Alaska, right? Right. And the federal government came back and said, well, that's true, but that doesn't apply to us. So, I mean, to sit there and claim that you have rights... Mm-hmm. Is pertained to yourself from a piece of paper is ridiculous in the first place. Yeah, we just got. How's that anyway. working out for you, Schaefer? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, how's yeah. that working out for you, anybody? 
It yeah, well, you know, it, it it really isn't working out for anybody, and you know, our our, our government's pretty much tossed aside the Ten Commandments along with the uh, with the Constitution, and uh, basically, you know, you you, ha- you have the option in your, in your life. You know, there there are good people in this world, and there are bad people in this world, and laws don't make bad people good. Yeah, and that's laws not don't kill make good the government. Good. Laws don't make good people good. So. You know, no, we, it's having a monopoly, not only on the use of force, but on the interpretation of law, having a monopoly on having the a enforcement monopoly on of law, law, having a monopoly on the protection of, that of your law. property, and the protection of law. It's all, it, when you, we handed over with the Constitution, when we, when we ratified the Constitution, we handed over to government the monopoly on protection and the use of force. Right, and the guarantee that they had when they first started that was that they had the right to secede. As long as they had the right to secede, they were basically okay. When we really got screwed was when the federal government got powerful enough to say you do not have the right to secede. You should be able to have the right as a state to secede. You should have the right as a person to be able to secede. As long as you are bound by this just by the odd chance that you were born in this country... You're automatically forced to comply. You're not free. That's, that's a very true statement. All right, I man. can't argue that one. Appreciate your call. All right. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Hi, you're on the air. Morning, guys. Morning. Hey, just back to this jury stuff. Uh, it's just too bad people don't read anymore because if people would read, they would know that our first Chief Justice, John Jay, yes, actually sir. said it was the duty of the jury to judge the law. Right. He actually said that while it's common knowledge that a judge, the judges probably know the law better than the jurors. Sure. Okay, I'll give him that. That's what they go to school for. That's what they commit their life to. But like you just said, he also said, but he told the jury themselves before jury in a jury trial, he would tell them, but it is your duty to judge the law. Exactly. The first United States Supreme Court chief justice. Yeah, in fact, that that is the only thing the jury is technically supposed to do, right, Josh, is judge law. I mean, because you, you don't need anybody to say, hey, uh, so-and-so was driving 55 miles an hour in a 45-mile-an-hour speed zone. Did, did, he, did he break the law? It's like, well, yeah, I mean, if there's a law that says 45 miles an hour is the law, then sure, he's breaking the law. And you don't need 20 people to say, yep, he broke the law. I mean, any any sixth grader can do that right the the whole point is is jury's supposed to say well why is there a law that says he can only go 45 miles an hour i mean it's the middle of the highway there's nobody living around there this just doesn't make sense right we were talking about this on the break that uh the only thing a jury really needs to know i mean because we're saying well they don't read enough they don't know this they don't know that how are they going to supposed to know if they want to find someone not guilty how do they know if a law is bad all you need to do if you're on a jury is tell yourself do I ever want to be charged with this law? Do I ever want this charge? Do I ever want to be on that stand and charged with this same law? If you don't, find the guy not guilty. Don't ever, don't think, well, I'm never going to do that. Just think, what? Do I ever want to be charged with this law? Yeah, with I, this hope crime? The, I hope the feds never show up here and take us to jail for conspiring to kill people from um, Mars. Venus. Well, no thing about because it. it's you, all you have to know as a juror. If if you're going to go on a jury or whatever, just ask yourself. Have a little self-respect and say, do I ever want to be charged with this crime? And if you don't want to be charged with that crime, whether you think you're going to do it or not, find the guy not guilty. That's all you need to do. And the greatest part about it is um, if they would have found Schaefer Cox not guilty based on the law, then the next guy that the feds picked up wouldn't even have had to go through all this monkey wrench because he could have just cited that case law. He could have said the jury in Alaska already decided... But that that's bunk. Law is bunk. So out it goes. That that actually brings up, uh, in my personal opinion, one of the biggest reasons of why the federal government is so adamant in pursuing cases like this is it's it, it's not because they think that Schaefer Cox is as an individual or even as a small group, you know, powerful enough to come against them. It's that they have to create precedent for future cases. I mean, basically, in the past ten years after the Patriot Act and after you know. Everything that's happened after 9/11, um, the federal government has had to, you know, extort, cage, and attempt to try. Well, actually, and they're not even incentivized to even try people for laws that really don't even exist. And so, any time that 
a case comes along where you where you have a guy where the where the where the public's like, yeah, well, he was crazy and he's a special case, so we'll we'll let you go ahead and throw the book at him that you know this this book doesn't exist. Every single time that that happens, it creates case precedent, and case precedent is what is the most powerful tool in in a, in a courtroom when you're arguing for you know well is this right or wrong? They say, oh, well, go back and look at this case. Look at look at how this was tried. This is the exact same thing. So obviously it's law. Yeah. Let's take some more calls. Two. All right. Four, yeah. five, eight, talk. Hi, you're on the air. Yeah. Good morning here. Battle Axe here. How are you going, Battle Axe? Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> I, you know, want to tar and feather some judges, so gee whiz. <laughs> Now, I don't necessarily think you should say things like that because <laughs> what just happened in Anchorage could also happen to you just by those yeah, mere well, words. Well, that is one thing here. I have a book, aside the Constitution, a, a book called The Intent of the Constitution, written in the late 1890s by the Chief Justice Souter of the United States Supreme Court. And in it, he emphatically states that a person is to be charged, tried, where the crime happens. And this nonsense of taking them out of their banks and putting them in Anchorage to be tried goes to show that up here in Fairbanks, the FBI acknowledges that we do know our Constitution and the yo-yos in Anchorage do not. They even admitted that if he was tried in Fairbanks, he might get off. Well, I, I, the reason I don't necessarily agree with that is because I think that a jury here in Fairbanks would have still judged the facts as they were presented to them, and they would not have stood up and judged the law for what it was. It wouldn't. Yeah, they, but still, the either, fact is. Either way, that, he should have been tried here because this is where Fairbanks. he lives. Right. I, yeah. And I agree with that, but I, as long as the jury is going to judge what's presented to them as it's presented to them, there is going to never be any justice. Right, so you have um, you have mu a whole bunch of to do about the uh, uh, Firearms Freedom Act that got passed here in Alaska, right? Uh, and that actually made us absolutely no more freer in the sense of firearms ownership than we already were. But the judge or the jury down there in Anchorage could have said not guilty to the firearms charges that Schaefer was brought up on, and over in one minute freed us up from all firearms regulation. Well, yes, but uh, the uh, another point I have been noticing, I uh, maintain that in a case where the federal government is charging a citizen, uh, taking a citizen to court, whether it's tax court or criminal court, no federal employee should be allowed to be in that jury. And I have noticed when we had a... Uh, tax thing here years ago and the guy was convicted and uh, half the juries were federal employees. Now, uh, I think that's kind of funny, but I do think it's illegal. And uh, and uh, if you want to read the intent of the Constitution and see what they knew then and what we know now and what are we doing now, it'll curl your hair. Plus, he also brought the fact that uh, Supreme Court justice it should not be a lifetime employment, and uh, maybe 10 years, and I'll take a little. But uh, now we see we get people in there that they'll have to die on the job before they can get out. And uh, you know, Which I, I, I think would be preferable to a uh, term limit of some kind, though. Uh, no, 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 because uh, they are not elected. They are appointed. That's where we got into the hoofah when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was stack, trying to stack the Supreme Court. Government has to have restraints. So just like this <clears throat> yo-yo, that's the nicest word I can say about the President of the United States, just, uh, you know, flat out stated that he was going to make the law. Uh that's your problem there. That is one reason why we suffered through Franklin Delano Roosevelt and we said, hey, 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 we have got to put term limits on the president because he has all this power. Well, the same thing should apply to the Congress because they they want the power. 
anybody that goes in there wants to Right, but in the, in the same breath, we fear the ones whose terms are almost up and the, how destructive they'll be because their terms are almost up. But we sit there and we tell ourselves that. Like, it, we can't let Obama get elected again because he Obama will know that he only has four more years no matter what, right? So the big, you know, you have all the right talk shows and uh, all of the pro uh, Romney. The biggest thing that all of them are citing is the fact that Obama only have four years left. And how destructive will he be knowing that he's his his term is done? I mean, if he gets voted in, that's it. He can do whatever he wants because he didn't have to come up for a re-election ever again for the rest of his life, right? So he's going to be so destructive. Well, and, you see, uh, the point but, of the Constitution was the, the, uh, the House of Representatives it didn't used to have senators. Right, but I'm, uh, I'm addressing what, you saying that we should... Put a limit on how long somebody should be in there. So in one breath we sit there and say that we should limit how long they have power, but then we sit there and say, oh, they're almost out, their power is almost done, they're going to be as destructive as possible. It doesn't make any sense. It's better off just to eliminate Congress, Senate, and the President. That would be, not physically, but actually remove that office permanently. Then we'd be a lot better off. Doesn't matter who's going to be in there. Just get rid of the office. We have two generations of people now that have no idea of the Constitution because the schools have been dumbing them down and not teaching. 1949 in Salem, Oregon, our class went to a jury trial. And right then and there, before it started, when the judge was addressing the jury, he pointed out that they had the right to judge the law. Well, that's pretty sweet. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the call. Thank you. Hi, you're on the air. Well, let's go here. Hi, you're on. Yes, I'd like to uh, reaffirm all your points on Schaefer Cox today and demonstrate the irony of while Obama is bringing Muslim fascists to power with wars in you know Arab Spring countries and Muslim infiltrators to the government at the same time you know he's stamping out patriots and people with a sense of freedom. And what happened to Schaefer Cox would be like, you know, out in my yard, it's kind of like the Cambodian killing fields right now against the squirrels. And, uh, you know, I have uh, on my desk a piece of paper with Steve Floyd's name on it. And, uh, you know, it says, like, um, uh, Herr Fugel Floyd is a Nazi speech fascist. So if if uh, Steve Floyd was found in a big squirrel wheel chasing his tail, you know, they could trace that back to me. And that's about as close as Schaefer Cox's uh, thing was. To what are you talking about? Well, do you understand? Just because somebody's name is on a piece of paper and there was no plan, oh. Schaefer Cox was always in a defensive mode, not in an aggressive mode. And they're connecting you know, the name on the paper and saying that, you know, that was a conspiracy. Oh, they were saying he was in an aggressive mode because they came armed to KJMP, so he was... But he that's, was, that's what you do to defend yourself. Well, right, but that's not the way they convoluted. They said that he right, was setting course, the situation up for aggression. And what I wanted to say was that we should, you know, lose the judge with letters of character, you know, before the sentencing in September... Because once again, I'm affirming with you that. If well, it I was. I went him, down. I was down happened. in that trial. They had an insane amount of character witnesses for Coleman, Barney, Schaefer, Cox. I don't think there's any for Lonnie Vernon, but for Schaefer, Cox, and Barney, definitely. You know, if there's a big media hoopla, which you know Steve Floyd and Michael Dukes have not done anything for that. You know, if, if uh, which I appreciate you guys bringing it up and being uh, nailing it on the head today and getting it out there. And if there's a, a, a hue and cry and a chorus of, you know, the injustice of this and the irony of the fact that Eric Holder has 200 Mexicans dead and uh, two uh, U.S. agents dead from their gun running uh, and compare the fact that nothing happened, you know, and, and what a... Uh, talk about a witch hunt. Yeah, well, something definitely happened in the Holder thing, didn't it? 
definitely well, happened with the gun running. Well, two people died, and, and that's our president and Eric Holder, and these are the same people of the Department of Justice that spent billions, or I mean millions, going after for a year and a half Schaefer Cox for nothing, just for free speech in public, free speech in public that didn't threaten anyone. It was just, you know, disgusting speech, but free speech. Yeah, some of the stuff so, he said was stupid, but it doesn't mean that you go to jail for the rest of your life. Exactly. That's our point. So I appreciate, and we should keep on it, and until um, everyone understands that, you know, first it's Schaefer Cox, and then it's you. Exactly. Yes, thank you. This is the first time I've appreciated anything you guys have said. Thank you. <laughs> well, we, my life's goal is That's complete. It. I don't think that was a uh, compliment, Josh. Oh. <laughs> it was hard to tell, actually. All right. All right. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, <clears throat> Hi this is Randy. Bingo. Just, just want to also say that uh, people should be thinking about uh, between here and September, you know, sending a letter to the judge asking for leniency. I mean, that might be the best we can hope for at this point. And uh, and uh, and I also wanted to mention, you know, back on May 1st, they had some articles about those uh, five guys in Cleveland that wanted to bomb a bridge in Cleveland. Right. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, it, it was a similar situation. They also infiltrated that group with an FBI person and... Uh, might even try to gin up, you know, what they were doing, you know. But anyway, uh, those informant people uh, did supply them with what those five men thought were plastic explosives and detonator devices. But the difference between that, I mean, it was a, to- a totally different thing. Those men, you know, were protesting against corporate America, had been involved in the Occupy Cleveland movement, different motivations, different everything. But anyway, they actually stuck these devices on the supports of this 80-year-old bridge going across the river in uh, Cleveland, and actually tried to detonate them. And then they arrested them. So really? The way I heard it is that uh, they tried to back out. Yeah. No, they did several times, but they kind of got pushed into it. They the, kept getting pushed into it. They tried, those were those wacky They tried to back like out that. how many times? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, somebody, one of them group, uh, actually tried to detonate it, and then when it wouldn't work, they called the guy over. that supplied the detonator and the uh, transmitter. Was They were using text messages from a cell phone. And I don't know if they were trying to kill anybody. It may have been early in the morning. I don't know the details if they saw a time when there was no cars on it, but they wanted to keep people from going to work to corporate America. Anyway, they were kind of nutty people, obviously. But uh, yeah, but should... the, the government admitted that they tried to back out of that. I How did. many times? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. But yeah, all that needs to be taken into consideration. But Schaefer, on the other hand, didn't, like you pointed out, didn't want to hurt anybody who was real, and anybody that he thought he might hurt was totally in a defensive mode that were trying to kill him. I think I read that he even said to his men, if it's uh, state troopers or some law yep, enforcement that identify arms. themselves, you know, put down your arms. I mean, that's open and shut. Uh, and I do think that had it been in, in uh, Fairbanks, the people would have had a little more sense. All right, Randy, thanks. Educating yourself? Yeah, we're just having a little discussion here off here. Yeah, basically, I was just saying that uh, it, it's so easy, f- and I see so many people who have really strong opinions about, you know, what the government's doing right, what the government's doing wrong, and then you start asking about what they've read, and they're like, oh, well, I, I just kind of came up on the, with this on my own. It's like, well, that's cool. I mean, freedom does come from our individual view of the world around us, but at the same time, if you don't, you know, if you don't, if, if you don't read and if you don't understand what's going on, it's educate yourself. Yeah, Is that exactly. what you're saying? Wow. I mean, it's really hard for me to take a lot of these people seriously when they're like, "Oh, you know, this is the this is the way things are." It's like, well, not really. Ought they to be that way? Yeah. No. Right. I mean, like, um, take the last caller. He's called in a million times, and uh, he'll call in and say, in one breath, you know, we all need to stand up for um, for what's right, and we all need to send letters to the judge asking for leniency, this and that. But at the same time, we need to force all of our children to pledge allegiance to the state. That doesn't even make any sense. I mean, where do you, where do you get those two contrasting views from? Where how do you say on one hand, we shouldn't let the government be overreaching, we shouldn't um, let unions band together and oppress us, this and that, but we should all pledge allegiance to the state. We should all give over monopoly of power to the state. But we don't want to have a monopoly of power of the state. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it does, Aaron. You just don't understand. Oh, You'll right. Get there. I don't get it. You didn't go to public school long enough. Oh, that was the problem. <laughs> I didn't go to public school at all. Oh, snap. 
I was going to say, I just had my 10-year reunion, and uh, I kind of made the uh, the realization that it's taken me 10 years to even start to unlearn everything that I learned in public school. I did go to public school. Sadly. I knew there was something wrong with you. Yeah, that that is definitely the start of it, at least. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did you go to public school, Schmitty? No, I did not. Really? You really? No. Dog. no, my parents sent me to Catholic school. Hmm. Which, uh, that's what's wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get sufficiently brainwashed. <laughs> uh, if you guys want to hit some more. Oh, sure. Might as well. Go to yeah. phones. Yeah, yeah sure. Hi, you're on the air. Yes, Winston. Hey, Winston, how's it going? Uh, going good. Oh, uh, getting back to the, to the, to the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, uh, at the time they were, yeah, y'all study history. Uh, 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 well, at the time of the Constitution, there was a, a, a group of people. They wanted a Bill of Rights. Right. Uh, 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 they didn't want ten amendments to the Constitution. They wanted a statement uh, 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 from the from the prospective government stating what our rights were. Mm-hmm. And the government, at, even at that time. Uh, uh, was so crooked uh, 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 that, that that they refused to give them a bill of rights. They said, "Well, we'll we'll pay ten amendments, right? Uh, 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 stating what your rights are." But by them making amendments out of them, that meant they could change them. Yep. Uh, 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 a statement of rights would have been a statement of rights. Right. They basically wanted something more along the lines of what England had. They had a Bill of Rights there, basically, and right. led by uh, Patrick Henry. He was anti-federalist, and he was one of the ones that, uh, I mean, if you go back and read what they were fighting over back then, that was his big deal was, we don't have any rights under this Constitution. It will take all of them from us. We have we are not protected. This federal government you're going to create will encompass our lives. He, li- he actually said that. This will eventually encompass our whole life. And right. by golly, was he right. Yeah, right. from... From a from a from a lawyer's perspective, it's really easy to uh, eventually enum- or eliminate law that you don't like if you can enumerate those and Spell is- out, right. isolate them individually. Be like, well, we'll get rid of this one later, and this one later, and this one later. But if they're all together, tie you know self support. I mean, supporting against each other, it's a lot more difficult to remove them later on. Mm-hmm. Patrick Henry is uh, 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 probably my favorite uh, uh, one of the founding fathers. Yeah, mine too. He, uh, uh, he uh, 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 he was adamant in his views. He he refused. Uh, he he was asked several times to to take a federal post, uh, and and he refused. Uh, but he served as governor of of Virginia for five terms. I think he was elected six terms, and he refused to serve the sixth term. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 but yeah. he uh, he, he was a he revolutionary. Avoided. He 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 was a uh, 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 his mind was screwed on right. Yeah. I thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for the call, Winston. Thank yep. you. Hi, you're on the air. You know what? I think this line just isn't working. Every time we go to two, there's nobody there. So maybe I'll just blank that one out. Hi, you're on. We dropped off, and hello, you're on the air. Hey, good morning. Morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. This is Frank Turney here. Hello, Frank. I'm getting a lot of static at my end, but I heard the last gentleman, he was referring to George Mason uh, uh, regarding the father of the Bill of Rights in Virginia. Of course, you know, the Bill of Rights came after the English Bill of Rights, Right. the origins of it, but uh, it was George Mason. He was the great founder uh, of our Bill of Rights uh, when it comes to the Ten Amendments. In fact, if you do a little more research, you'll find out George Mason... uh, I wrote uh, many of the quotes uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, many of the writings of uh, uh, Patrick Henry. Uh, uh, he was one of our forgotten founding fathers. Yep. Hey, uh, why I call regarding, uh, I never had an uh, opportunity. It would have been great to be able to observe the, the two-for-one, uh, so-called two-for-one trial at Shaver Cock. But one thing I'd like to find out, if I could, uh, uh, you know, I know the federal government hired a henchman. What I mean by henchman, they're jury consultants to investigate the jury pool. These investigators go in and they have all the data of who's coming up for jury, and the federal government releases them. Now, listen, this is a little different from Bodier, you know, who decides uh, 
uh, who's even picking on the jury. Right. Uh, these jury consultants are very expensive. They go in, investigate everything about you. Uh, how many rolls of toilet paper, how many cars you got drive, who your neighbors, who you associate with. And I remember uh, Justice Supreme Court Justice O'Connor was speaking in a judiciary hearing. She thought that the, when the government uses a jury consultants for selecting process, it's not a fair uh, checks and balances when it comes to that process. And so they can just pick who they want and make it come out the way they want. And another thing I think was important to this uh, was the evidentiary hearing, whether it be state and federal court. This is very important, the evidentiary hearings, to de determine what evidence can be heard before a jury. And I know the defense and the prosecutor argues, but ultimately it's up to that judge to determine uh, what is admissible, what isn't admissible. And many times, even you see on appeal, a lot of things that weren't admissible were pertinent to the defendant's case. So what I see, uh, uh, Schaefer's got, uh, and his attorneys, I've talked to a couple of them, and uh, uh, they have a lot of things that we're objected to, and I think that he's going to win a lot of these appeals, myself personally. Well, I hope so. It'll take him quite a few years under the federal system, but I'm getting a lot of static in here. And, uh, hey, uh, Josh, uh, I haven't forgot that promise, and... Uh, I'll be passing the hat to have people contribute to this uh, TV, to this radio show because I think it's very informative. But uh, most of all, I like when you talk about individual freedom and liberty. That's more important than anything today. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. More important than voting. <laughs> Should we go down that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again. Let's take another coercion by ballot. Is that what we just mentioned? Hi, right, you're on the air. Hey, this is Charles the poet. Charles, what you got for us today? Uh, Frank said something about the forgotten founding fathers. Yep. And I'd like to contribute James Otis to that list. Uh, he took on the case of the writs of assistance, did lose, but it was return, reversed on appeal. And uh, he is the one that began the uh, declarations of independence. And there were several... King George himself declared that we were independent. We could take care of ourselves. He got so fed up with us. But uh, John Adams his claim credit for a declaration. Uh, but anyway, James Otis quit his service for the royalty, for the king, in order to take on the writs of assistance. Sam Adams gives him a lot of credit for his speech there, and, uh, you know, he uh, died of a lightning strike, so probably that had something to do with him being forgotten. He was beat over the head with a cane by one of the uh, court officers, and uh, he probably had some mental problems, too, but uh, James Otis... Sometimes those are the kind it takes. Yeah, you know... Uh, Every one of them was a liberal, except for Benedict Arnold. So uh, <laughs> that's my opinion. Uh, thanks for the show. Yep, thanks for calling, Charles. Okay. You, Hi, you're on the air. Yeah, this is true. Go hey, ahead. Again, nobody ever thought about charging the FBI with a conspiracy. They, uh, well, they're definitely the ones that conspired, aren't they? I mean, yes, they, they are. If you want to talk about making a plan and going forward with the plan and doing the plan... That's yeah, right. that would be the FBI. You know, you should go up to the uh, university library up there on the fifth floor. They've got uh, 11 copies of the Magna Carta. And that'll tell you what your jury of peers are. The yeah. People, your, neighbors, your neighbors and people who know you and who know the law. Yep. Not, N just, not uh, statutory law either, but no common law, which is basically do everything that you say you will do and don't harm anyone's property or person. That's right. all it is. Right. That's the Constitution right. didn't give us any rights. It just protected the rights we already had. Yep, that's right. It's supposed you know, to. At least. People keep saying you got civil rights. Mm -hmm. Civil Rights Act didn't go into the mid-60s. What kind of rights did you have before then? Exactly. You had substantive rights. Civil yeah, rights. They exist today. Civil rights can be taken from you. If they're granted from the government, they can be taken from the government. That's so right. You Anything have to the government decide. gives you, they can take away. Yep. So you have to decide whether your rights come from a state or if your rights are inherent just because you're alive. People I'm keep, people keep saying that the Constitution is gone or the Bill of Rights is gone. Just remember Marbury versus Madison. And Marbury versus Madison can never be overturned because there's no longer any constitutional judges. The uh, 
anything that's in conflict with the Constitution is null and void of law. Nobody's bound to obey it, and no courts are bound to uphold it. Just remember that. The Constitution right, is well. But when we enacted the Constitution and created Congress, right, D don't we, didn't we write there lend legitimacy to any law? No. When we give Congress, well, sure we did. When Congress is allowed to create law, right? They're allowed to create uh, paper laws. They're, they're not allowed, allowed to create anything that's unconstitutional. Right, but the Constitution exclusively grants the right and the power to Congress to create law. And change the Constitution. And change the Constitution, exactly. So how is it unconstitutional for Congress to legislate law, which they do? Well, well, I mean, we could fight all day long whether a law that they pass is constitutional or not. But the problem is, is that the Constitution has no. Teeth. Right. We, we, you. Well, that's my point. He just. You guys just said that the Constitution doesn't grant us rights. It doesn't grant us any liberties, right? Correct. But then you're going to turn right around and say, but Congress can't create laws that are unconstitutional. So you just said that the Constitution isn't granting any liberties or any rights, but then turning around and saying, but i got to use it to grant my liberties and rights. No, not necessarily. You could use the Constitution. It, it doesn't have to just do with rights, Aaron. It also has to do with what function of government is or ought to be. Right, but the Constitution so, exclusively gave Congress exclusively the power to legislate law, to create law. Right, I know. So you can't, can't say, you, can't say, you can't say that any laws that Congress passes are unconstitutional because they don't line up with the Constitution. Of course they line up with the Constitution. The issue is whether individual liberty comes into play or not. The Constitu We just sit, sat there and said the Constitution doesn't give us liberty, but we want to use it and say that we want to hold any laws that Congress creates against the Constitution that doesn't give us liberty. No, not By the way, you don't have weapons. You have firearms. You never have weapons. You always have firearms. Just mm -hmm. remember that. Keep them bare arms. All right. Go. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Right, you're on the air. Yeah, this is uh, Frank again. Uh, regarding the Schaefer oh, case, thanks. does anyone know whether uh, Schaefer's defense attorney or any of the two-for-one defendants challenged the jury instructions as far as the jury, the law as well as the facts? Yeah, I have no idea, Frank. And number two is, I heard from the grapevine, uh, three character witnesses, uh, and uh, I heard the prosecution didn't come off, or neither did the judge object to it. They got up and talked about jury rights before this federal jury. Are you aware of that? I heard it from you and maybe one other person, Frank. That's all. Well, that's pretty heavy. I've never heard of that before without being objected from a prosecutor or the judge. That's why I was just wondering, at the final comment, I just wonder what the jury instructions was to the judge, to the jury, whether he even brought that up. Doubtful. That's very interesting. That's very rare that uh, that happens in front of a jury. Right. Yeah, I don't know... Uh... I don't know if they, someone got that past the prosecutor or not to the jury, but it doesn't seem normal. It definitely is not normal. Yeah, I, yeah two, uh, two Fairbanks uh, residents, I talked to them both, in fact, three of them, and they all uh, said that uh, they testified in court, and even for five minutes, the prosecutor questioned them about jury rights. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I actually I, I heard a similar rumor about um, the fact that the judge did allow it. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the show. Of course, I also heard that the judge simply said at, when they were finalizing at, at the end of the uh, court session, he basically ex exonerated the jury for the fact that they followed the law. They did their job. Exactly. They did their duty as Americans by finding someone guilty for the state. He said that they um, had a challenge to decipher everything and, and see which laws apply and how the law applied. Definitely not to um, judge the law in the first place. Which, yeah, too bad. That's a pretty sad thing. I mean, the, the, uh, the jury is so important. I mean, you could actually get away with having... You could actually get away with having the government if juries did their job. Because you could just... You could whittle away the government down to nothing. Anytime you got hauled into court, if you are found not guilty, what good would those laws be? It, 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 would they at disappear? the very least, you would, have, you would have some kind of protection from an overreaching government. I mean... If the juries exercise their duty to judge the law, how could government ever get out of control? Mm -hmm. Well, eventually all they could do is just start shooting people. Forget going Either to court that or not allow juries to judge the law. Right. <laughs>
Yeah, just oh. just neuter the juries. Right, so that's where we came from because we started out having the juries had the right to do that. So instead Actually, of killing people, they just they were instructed to do that, and now they're instructed that their duty is to judge the facts as they're presented to them. And listen to the judge. Do as you're told, like your school teacher told you when you were in kindergarten. I would like somebody to call up and tell me that is pro the way that the system is right now. That doesn't think that it needs to be different. And explain what purpose a jury would have if their only duty is to judge the uh, facts. facts as they're presented to them. There's no purpose in a jury at all. Right. You you don't you don't need somebody to say, hey, uh, they broke this law. Did they break this law? It's, I mean, it's a yes or no question. It seems like. I'm sure it is. So the cop says, I have you on a radar gun going 55 and a 35. You're guilty. Do you need a jury to no. tell you that, no, the yes, cop, you did? The, the cop just did a pretty good job of it right there. Right. And he's also, you you and him are the only two that uh, can argue back and forth because you were the only two people who were actually there. Yeah, basically. Yeah, the what... greatest part about Schaefer's deal is <clears throat> that he was the only one there. <laughs> Her baby wasn't all there, but the uh, <laughs> the, the Colorado hit squad what definitely wasn't there. Yeah, the question comes down to this. Are you guilty of breaking a law? Yes. Are you innocent of wrongdoing? Just because you break a law, are you innocent or guilty of wrongdoing? You might be guilty of breaking that law, but There's are no. you innocent? Right, but that that's what we have construed into wrongdoing. Right, is right? breaking the law itself. Breaking the law itself. Even though it doesn't have anything to do with do whatever you say you're going to do, contract law, or don't harm anyone's property or person. Right, where's, the, in, where's the injured party in Schaefer Cox's trial? They can't have one. There is none. Well, the, there is now. Yeah, Schaefer Cox. Schaefer Cox is the injured <laughs> and party. And his family. And Coleman's family. And what, Michael what Anderson's happened, family. What happened to um, Karen Vernon? I think that's a totally separate uh, trial. She's going to get tried all... By yourself. Yeah. And I think Lonnie will be tried in that also. So based on our recent history with this trial, we pretty much know how that one's going to come out. All right. You, you, the yeah, great... precedent now. Yeah. Good job, <laughs> jury. The greatest part about all this is we just gave the FBI the green light to do whatever they want in the state. Yep. Oh, oh that was brilliant. Yep. So and now, believe us, now they nobody's will. safe. Right. And they will exercise. So, we would suggest that people keep their mouth shut. Don't talk about things that you shouldn't be talking about. Don't call this show. <laughs> Turn the radio station as fast as possible. Yeah. Don't hang Was out there... with Abe Tolman. Hey, He's a terrorist. I, I'm hanging out with you guys because I think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a call then. Hi, right, you're on the air. Yeah, I need one more shot, Frank Journey. I'd just like to share something from my Freedom Calendar. Uh, I don't know if people know Doug Buchanan. He passed away here a few months ago. He was a Fairbankson. Uh, he was a mountain climber and a constitutionalist, and he wrote this regarding the role of the jury. The true function of the jury is not as many things to dispense punishment to fellow citizens accused of breaking government-authored law, but rather to protect fellow citizens from tyrannical abuses of power by the government. Look at the two-for-one case. <laughs> yeah. The informant, the government informant that inflamed everybody. Yep. Yeah. It just goes on and on and on. It's it's a it's a dirty game when you're dealing with the feds. And that's one thing about it. When you talk to the city, state, or the federal government, you have a right to remain silent because anything you say can and will be again uh uh, against you in the court of law. Yeah. So I never talk to the police. I just give them my, uh, my address and my name, and that's it. Right. Because you're basically they're, they're, they're trained how to manipulate the lie and confuse people during an investigation. Name, rank, and serial number. That's Thank it. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny. When I went down there and testified in the Schaefer Cox trial, um, the lawyers that I met up with, all of the defense attorneys, they all told me that I needed to go. When I got home, I needed to retain a permanent lawyer because the FBI is so vindictive that they would most likely come after me and for anything that they could possibly imagine for daring to go down there and testify against them. That's freedom, baby. Which is funny. Before I even made it there, the FBI had already called me. Well, as soon as they found out that I was coming down there to testify, they called me and drilled me inside and out about what I was going to talk about. That doesn't quite seem right either, does it? Is that witness intimidation? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know if it is or not, but I know that it's pretty disturbing when I get told by 
um, three different attorneys and a private investigator that, or two different attorneys and a private investigator that I need to definitely retain a permanent lawyer because of the vindictiveness of the FBI. How about that one dude, I don't remember his name, that Anderson got when he got whacked, put in jail or whatever. We know for a fact that one of the city cops here outright, flat out, lied about Michael to go along with the case. I mean, we know it for a fact. The guy lied. Right, and they, city policemen they proved lied. that he lied right. because he said he, Michael Anderson was spying on him in X, XYZ vehicle and Michael Anderson never even owned said vehicle and never even met him before. Right. Yeah, that's great. How's that perjury law working out for Ah, uh, they're exempt. They're taught to lie. Oh, they're exempt? Yeah. Oh. Huh. I mean, that's a fact. Cops are taught to lie on the stand. So, huh. how's that working out for us again? Proud to be an American. Yeah, I was going to say, specifically with, like, regards to cops, I was driving down Pega Road the other day, and uh, there was a guy pulled, across, uh, pulled over by both a city cop and a state trooper. And I'm sure it was for something, you know, like he was speeding or a blinker was out or whatever. Um, but I thought it was really interesting that... Uh, us citizens are supposed to be duped into the fact that these guys are just out to protect us when, in fact, I'm sure what was going on as far as an argument between the two cops is who has jurisdiction, which basically translated to me as who has the right to extort this guy for some money because he broke a law that doesn't hurt anybody. I think that that's something that is, at least for myself, I, I have to keep in mind every, every day that, you know, the... The cops, there are some good guys out there who are trying to do good, but yep. the bottom line is is they all work for the same guy, and that is an oppressive government that doesn't really care about you. It only cares about what it can get from you and what you can do to keep them in power. Protect and serve the crap out of you. Yeah, by uh, fining you for going five miles over the street. All right, I got a ticket the other day for um, having a headlight out, but it was also like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But <laughs> I have a truck that, well, it doesn't even get dark at all. Right. But I argued with the guy. I said, well, why would I be getting a ticket for having a headlight out when it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon? And he's like, well, that's beside the point. You can't have a headlight out. And he wrote me a ticket for it. Well, you got to make money, Aaron. You have a job, don't you? What? (laughs) Got to make money. I was going to say something. No, I have that ticket in my truck. If anybody wants to challenge that, we'll go look at the time on it. It's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon for having a headlight out. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess it does make sense. You broke the law. You should go to jail, too, I think. I'd be the first one to testify against you. (laughs) Let's take a call. (laughs) Hi, you're on the air. Hi, yeah, the, the point is that they've achieved their aims because if people are afraid to speak, that's all that they wanted anyway. Sure, that's just what, like, that's true. It's just like in the Ted Stevens thing. Uh, you know, if they can smear him and take a a, a known briber of politicians who also ran a underage pedophilia prostitution ring and, and say, oh, we'll give you leniency and, and see if we can scrape up something, anything, anything on Ted Stevens. Did you leave a massage chair in his house? Okay, good, let's go. Uh, to bring down the, you know, longest... Uh, you know, Republican top senator in the Congress. You know, that's all that they wanted to do. And so if anyone is afraid of using their free speech, they've won. Yeah, so well... don't be afraid and speak and ask everyone you know. Do you think Schaefer Cox uh, should be in jail? <clears throat> and keep the hue and cry going because this is the, you know, the volley that at the same time as Eric Holder and Obama are turning us over to the globalists and trying to collapse our economy... Did you know that the Frank Dodd bill put us on the hook for all of the derivatives, clearing houses around the world, which is about $600 trillion? And, you know, that's many, 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 many times past the the, uh, gross domestic product of the world. So while these globalists are putting us on this phony hook, free speech is all we have left. So keep talking, boys. Well, definitely the uh, Schaefer-Cox thing is something that uh, was a violation against all of us, I think. So it's not just about Schaefer-Cox. It's about the f- people. It's right, about but, us, but the but citizens. What's the mistake? The point is, the mistake that's made is that the jury didn't exercise their duty to judge the law. Right. They and that's all there is to it. I mean, they should have decided the fact that the FBI does not have the right to do those things without warrants. 
just well, because sure. they passed the Patriot Act saying, well, we can do whatever we want now. Really? How, how can the jury find any other verdict other than the one that they found if the only what they're instructed to do was to judge the facts as they're presented to them? The facts are is that the state was prosecuting and pressing charges against them for conspiracy to murder a Colorado hit team, right? Well, that's factual. That's what happened. Yep. All right. Well, we're about wrapped up here. Uh, got our websites, uh, patriotslament.blogspot.com, all one word, email, patriotslament.gmail.com. And then we got the uh, YouTube channel is uh, Radio Free Fairbanks on YouTube. And shop at Far North Tactical. Oh, yeah. Do that. Anyways, we out. All right. We'll all see right, you man. next week. Thanks for the show.